Okay, so this video is really all about how we would actually uh, estimate these numbers that we would like to have, uh, but that we don't have directly in you know, financial statements of, of firms. Um, and so one way that we're going to do that is to use econometrics in order to estimate both a, a total cost function, but then a, a marginal cost function as well. Um, and the way we do that, so we're going to say, you know, for simplicity, we're going to have a total cost function where we're going to have some cubic, right? So a Q, a Q squared and a Q cubed, uh, and then some input price. So W is the price of the input. We're using W because uh, it might be like the wage of the workers. Um, and then C0, C1 and C2 are cost parameters that we can estimate uh, econometrically. Now, of course, uh, as long as this is a close approximation of the total cost function, then we can take the derivative with respect to uh, Q in order to get the marginal cost function. And then that would just be C0 plus 2C1Q plus 3C2Q squared plus W. And so then we can use this estimate of the marginal cost along with output price data to calculate the learner index um, that we can't observe directly from the data. Um, so obviously the main weakness of this approach is that we're using accounting cost data instead of economic cost data. That's pretty much always going to be true, um, but it might be the best that we can do. Um, so when we can't do this, right, when it's impossible or impractical to, to estimate the marginal cost, we can still take advantage of average cost data uh, to estimate the degree of competition in a market. Um, so the idea here is that when costs go up, in perfect competition, price equals marginal cost, and so price should go up one for one. Um, but when you have market power and costs go up, then because of that market power, uh, your price will not go up uh, by the same amount. And so Sumner did this for the cigarette industry in 1981. And of course, not perhaps surprisingly, because it was cigarettes, um, he found he, he rejected the hypothesis that it was perfectly competitive, which is not a big surprise. Um, but then Hall and, and Doppelier found similar results uh, in manufacturing um, in both the United States and in Belgium. Um, and so basically this is just saying, all right, well, we're going to take these presumably exogenous uh, increases in uh, input costs and see how they get translated into prices. So the sort of newer technique is, is referred to as the new empirical industrial organization technique. And if I've said it once, I've said it many times, economists should never be allowed to name anything. Um, but there you go. So we call it the New Empirical Industrial Organization Approach, or NEIO. Um, and basically, it's, a kind of, it's an econometric uh, technique um, for trying to think about market power in an oligopoly setting. So we start with an inverse demand function. And so we're just going to... Um, estimate this inverse demand function, P equals A plus BQ plus D1Q times Y1 plus D2Y1 plus D3Y2, where Q is industry level of output, uh, and Y1 and Y2 are exogenous variables such as consumer income and the price of a substitute good. Um, and so the key here is that we have to have um, demand rotate or change uh, with Y1. So that would be we would think that would be true for, you know, for a normal good uh, consumer income, for instance, goes up, we would expect uh, demand to change uh, as well. So we're going to assume that the uh, marginal cost function takes the following form, C0 plus C1W, where W is the input price times QI. So this is an increasing uh, marginal cost function. Um, and then if we think about the first order condition, right, so P equals MC minus theta times DP, DQ, QI, then price depends on marginal cost, the behavioral parameter, and then the slope of the inverse uh, demand function, right, which we are going, so we're going to estimate these things um, with the equations that we just talked about. So the slope of the inverse demand function is just B plus D1Y, uh, and substituting that partial derivative and the marginal cost function into the supply relation, we get uh, going down to our second here equation here, P equals C0 plus C1 uh, WQI minus theta BQI minus theta D1Y1QI. 
And so we can rewrite this just with um, parameters, alpha, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, um, that we can actually estimate econometrically, right? So if we have pricing data and we have wage data and quantity data, and then this Y1, right, which we said might be, for instance, consumer income, uh, we can estimate these alphas um, and then eventually uh, solve for theta uh, using the alphas. All right, how are we going to do that? <laughs> so we use a regression analysis. Where we're going to estimate the two price equations jointly as a system of equations. So this is the problem with any kind of equilibrium um, outcome, right, such as price, is that it can be very difficult to find that, that relationship, right, find the relationship between price and quantity because really we have two different uh, relationships. Um, we do need firm level data. So we need firm level data as price, uh, individual output, total output, whatever our Y1 and Y2 are, right? So maybe uh, consumer income uh, and, and a price of a substitute good. And W, where W is the price of the input cost, like the wage. Um, but we don't need marginal cost, which is good because we don't usually have it. And so that's going to give us estimates for all of these parameters, right? A, B, D1, D2, D3, alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And then we can use those um, estimates to calculate our theta, right? So theta is not observed directly, but we know that it's the ratio of uh, two of these um, variables, right? So it's negative alpha two over B or negative alpha three over D one. And so as long as those aren't equal to zero, right? If they are equal to zero, then, then we don't have it. Uh, but as long as those aren't equal to zero, we can calculate theta and estimate some level of um, competition and then the learner index, right? Um, so we can also use it to estimate market power with industry data. And in this case, you're sort of summing up over the entire industry. Um, and we have some examples here, right? Where, you know, retail, meat, brewing, sugar refining, they have a very, very low learner index, meaning there's a lot of competition. Uh, whereas, you know, tobacco, photographic film, keeping in mind this was, you know, from the 80s and 90s, long distance phone service, yeah, that used to be a thing we had to pay for, um, had much less competition. Electric power, breakfast cereal is uh, about 0.45. And so those are all estimates that have higher uh, learner indexes or less competition. We can also think about, you know, um, whether or not uh, firm behavior is consistent with a specific game, right? So a static Nash game with either Corneau or Bertrand, Stackelberg or Cartel, um, and see if uh, they're behaving in the same way. And so Gazmi et al. in 1992 did this for premium cola, right? So Coke and Pepsi, basically. Um, and what they found comparing all these different types of models was that the Stackelberg model fit best, um, where Coke was a Stackelberg leader in price uh, over the entire sample period in advertising from 1968 through 1976, and that they colluded on advertising from 1977 to 1986. Um, so this was obviously data that was, uh, you know, a while ago. Um, but they also showed that market power increased over time and that Coke tended to have more market power than Pepsi did. So they had a strategic uh, advantage there. Then finally, what we want to think about is estimating the overall efficiency loss due to market power. Um, and so we've really already done this in class, right? In calculating that deadweight loss triangle. Um, so it's really just one half times the change in price, which is the difference between the, the actual price and the perfect competition price, and the change in quantity, which is the difference between the perfect competition quantity and the actual quantity. Um, so that's usually the easiest way to do it. Um, but what the book shows is that you can use um, a different method uh, where the deadweight loss is equal to one half times X squared, where X is the value of the, the profit to sales ratio for the industry, times eta, which is that absolute value of the price elasticity of demand, times total revenue. Um, and so Harberger, who originally did this in 1954, found that deadweight loss was less than 0.1% of GNP. I think that was for the manufacturing industry. Um, Mason and Shannon, who did this a little bit later in 1984, 
estimated that it was equal to about 2.9%. Um, so obviously that's a big difference uh, in how much static inefficiency is costing the economy over time. 0.1%, we could say, oh, that's not so a big deal. 3%, uh, that's a much bigger deal. Um, one of the points in the book was that this might have decreased uh, recently due to globalization, which has increased competition overall.